talking this morning about what a you know it was raining. It's kind of a crummy day outside, and um, but what a blessing it is to be healthy and be able to come here and uh, be together with the saints and hear the word of God and and then to hear. Uh, we specifically prayed uh, for Gardner and for Pat. Uh, and there's others, Dan mentions them uh, every week, but uh, uh, we, sh we should be uh, joyful people. Here we all are. It's, it's, a, it's a great blessing. So thank you for being here. Uh, turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to be reading uh, verses 39 through 56. So we've been studying the gospel writer Luke's historical account, but also very theological account of the births of John the Baptist and of Jesus, the Son of God. An angel, Gabriel, has entered into our material world to announce both births, and Luke's narrative is filled with wonder. Elizabeth the wife of the old priest uh, Zacharias was both barren and aged, and yet she became pregnant with the child who would become John the Baptist, the forerunner to the Messiah. This is the way the Lord has dealt with me, she said, when he looked with favor upon me. And now her relative Mary, a young virgin betrothed to be married but not yet, married, has had an encounter with the same angel who had informed her that she would miraculously conceive and give birth to the Son of God. And her response was one of a quiet heroism. Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. And now as we come to verse 39 of this first chapter, Luke deftly combines these two strands and records how the wonder only increases. Uh, the two women have an electric meeting, and Mary responds with her beautiful Magnificat, in which she sings a song of thanksgiving to God for the mercy that he has shown to her personally, a practice in keeping with the divine character, mercy. Uh, but then also she sings of the Lord's covenant loyalty displayed in his uh, covenant people, Israel. And so we begin reading in verse 39, now at this time Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord. I prefer my soul magnifies the Lord. That's what it means. My soul in, wants to enlarge the reputation of the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. 
He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. Well, there are two obvious movements in our passage. Uh, one is, in actuality, the beginning of John's witness to uh, the Messiah, to Christ. The other is Mary's grateful response of praise. It's understandable that one might read Mary's beautiful song and wonder, uh, how could this young girl uh, uh, just sort of off the cuff, it seems, have delivered such a content-filled, deeply theological ode of joy and worship in response to her meeting with Elizabeth. And I will respond to that in, in a moment. But here is the beginning of one of the most interesting and venturesome and, and at times heartbreaking lives ever lived. Mary was to be the mother of the Lord, the mother of the Son of God. I'm reading through the Gospel of John, and I came to that chapter 2 and the wedding in Cana, and you know that story. Uh, there is a wedding, and Jesus and his disciples are invited to the wedding, and his mother and his family are invited, and the worst possible thing happens. Uh, they run, the host runs out of wine, and uh, Mary goes to Jesus, her son, and says they have no wine, and his response appears to be rather flat, except he says, my hour has not yet come. But there is a subtle revelation of a relationship with her son in verse 5 of, of John chapter 2 when she immediately turns to the servers and says, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says, do it. Uh, Mary would look on in wonder. But her wonder was there from the beginning, and we see it here in Luke's Gospel. After the visitation of the angel Gabriel and his announcement of the coming birth of Jesus, Mary did not delay. She went in a hurry to the Judean region where Elizabeth and Zacharias lived. How do we explain her eagerness? Had her conception perhaps taken place so quickly that its very confirmation moved her to want to share it with the one who was in on her secret? Uh, surely her haste must have been tied to the bolstering sign that Gabriel had given her back in verse 36 that the much older Elizabeth, her relative, had conceived. A son was to be born to her in her old age, and Mary couldn't wait to share the similar miracles that had happened to the two of them. It was not a short journey from Nazareth to this city. We don't know, the city's not named where Zacharias and Elizabeth lived, but it had to have been at least a 70, maybe up to a 100 mile uh, journey south of Nazareth, a four to five day journey, and that would have given Mary time to reflect. The appearance of the angel, think about it, uh, had almost certainly triggered a flurry of arrangements and surely some less than comfortable conversations uh, with Joseph and within her family. But then she left on this journey and she was able to think four, five days of journeying and she had time to think. Now she would have been catechized. That's how pious Jewish families behaved. Uh, that means she had received a thorough acquaintance with the scriptures of the Old Covenant, the stories of God's faithfulness to the Jewish people and of the mighty triumphs of the heroes of the past would have been a part of the fabric of her upbringing. And she was grounded in the messianic hope 
that uh, diffused th uh, throughout the, uh, the uh, Jewish people. We must not think of Mary as some kind of prodigal saint, but neither ought we uh, picture her as a, a flighty adolescent. Uh, and now this dramatic event in her life would have brought everything she had been taught and all the preparation of her hot heart God had carefully cultivated together in her searching soul. And then she was there, uh, unannounced, uh, silhouetted, as one writer put it, against the door of this aged couple. She entered their house and greeted Elizabeth. One's anticipation met with the others, except Elizabeth's emotions were like nothing she'd ever experienced. Luke describes how when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, her baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth herself was filled with the Holy Spirit and, and cried out with this extended blessing that follows. Here was the very beginning of the witness of John the Baptist to his Lord. He was then a six-month-old fetus, still in his mother's womb. And it would have been a common experience, of course, you know this, for Elizabeth to have felt her unborn child move inside her, even kick a little. But that is not what the scripture is describing. It was when Mary's voice rang out that the baby inside Elizabeth leaped inside her. And then she was filled with the Holy Spirit. The three descriptions are linked and go together. Mary's greeting, the baby leaped, Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit. Look back at that 15th verse. It's easy for you. Just turn the page and... Gabriel's announcement to Zacharias, their promised son would be great, he said. And he would be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. We're not meant to necessarily understand this, uh, but to believe it. The unborn John the Baptist, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, was bearing witness to the presence of the unborn Messiah in Mary's own womb. It was nothing less than the miraculous rejoicing of John at the entry of the Lord into our world. Many years later, Jesus would give expression to that joy in John chapter 3, verse 29, by painting a lovely picture the friend of the bridegroom, he said, who hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Well, as I said, our story is filled with wonder. We can't do justice to it. And what a wonderful thing it is to believe it, uh, to think that God was even then working in the unborn John to set him about on his mission and even then indicating that the person in Mary's womb was worthy of our love and devotion and worship. I wouldn't want to fail to at least note the ramifications this scene received in faith has on the morality of abortion. And I say this humbly, not knowing who all is, is listening, but only six months old and not yet born, uh, the living fetus in Elizabeth's womb was a living person able to experience human emotion. He was given life by God himself, for God had a plan for him. And to imagine taking that life before he could fulfill God's plan is to know that God, the creator of life, would not have been pleased with that. Well, it was all the emotion the little baby could muster to leap in his mother's womb, but then his mother is able to give verbal expression to his feelings. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth offers uh, the first of a string of songs, or at least poetic expressions, 
that we find in these birth narratives. And first is Elizabeth's song, and then Mary's uh, Magnificat, and then Zacharias's at the end of the chapter, and then the angel's song in chapter two, and then uh, finally Simeon and his Nunc Dimittis, uh, also in the second chapter. But first Elizabeth, uh, filled with the Spirit, is unable to contain an outburst of joy over the way God has intervened to bring about such a blessing. And you'll note, see, you can see it in the flow of the passage, this series of pronouncements of blessing that she makes. Blessed are you, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, and blessed is she who believed. It wasn't that long ago we studied the Beatitudes, and so you'll remember that a person can only be blessed because it's because God has caused his favor to come upon him. And Elizabeth marvels at God's blessing. First, Mary is blessed. Blessed are you among women. Now that's an idiomatic way of saying you are the most blessed woman ever. Uh, heard Warren's prayer uh, talking about Mary and what a blessed woman she was. She was the most blessed uh, woman ever. Uh, but such a high evaluation, notice, depends entirely upon her son, for blessed is the fruit of your womb. Of course, he is blessed, the fruit of her womb. Uh, the father was ever delighted in his son, for he never failed him from the absolute beginning of his incarnation until his mission was accomplished. This is my beloved son, the father said, in whom I am well pleased. It's all too wonderful to believe, and Elizabeth registers her unworthiness to welcome the mother of her Messiah into her home. What has she done to deserve such an honor? How has it happened? Uh, she exclaims. Well, there's deep theological awareness in this scene, both on Elizabeth's part and on Mary's. For Elizabeth, Mary is the mother of my Lord. Her son is the Lord. It recalls the Messianic Psalm of David. If you think about it, Psalm 110 verse 1, where David uses the same title, my Lord, to describe the coming Messiah. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. But in verse 44, she explains how she reached that conclusion. When the sound of Mary's greeting had reached Elizabeth's ears, the child within her kicked as it had never kicked before, and Elizabeth, remember, filled with the Holy Spirit, knew it was no mere coincidence. We can only suppose this, too, that Zacharias, unable to speak, unable to hear, had somehow found a way to communicate to Elizabeth, as the months passed, the content of Gabriel's message to him from verse 17, that it would be their child who would go as a forerunner before the Messiah in the spirit and power of Elijah. She knew when the baby leaped, it was a leap of joy. And finally, in verse 45, Elizabeth pronounces a further blessing upon Mary for believing God's word to her. It may have been, we don't know, that Zechariah was standing there uh, with them in the room, silent, of course. Uh, he wouldn't have heard them, but his last blessing might have been, and uh, this last blessing might have been an unintentional rebuke to his previous unbelief. Mary was blessed, lastly, because she had believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. The Holy Spirit was bearing witness to both Elizabeth and Mary that Mary indeed was to be the mother 
of the Son of God. And where the Spirit is, joining hearts together in the revelation of the wondrous ways of God, there could be no place for envy on Elizabeth's part, only joy and worship. Well then, Mary sang out herself this beautiful hymn of response known as the Magnificat. It's called the Magnificat because the first word of the Latin translation of this verse is uh, Magnificat, Magnificat, Anima, Mea, Dominum. Uh, that's how we get Magnificat. Well, we've mentioned the preparation Mary had to, to be used by the Holy Spirit and what she expresses. The song is saturated with biblical language. One of the older commentators cited 12 different Old Testament passages reflected line by line, along with several similarities to Hannah's a prayer from 1 Samuel chapter 2. It's almost impossible that Mary would not have had Hannah's prayer in her heart in the day since the angel's announcement. You don't have to go back to it, but this is how Hannah's prayer begins. My heart exalts in the Lord. And then goes on to speak of his salvation and his attributes and his care for the lowly. Uh, likewise, Mary's song, taken as a whole, reveals a reverent spirit and knowledge of God's attributes suitable to the mother of the Lord. It reflects Mary's consciousness of the exalted role God had given her in fulfilling uh, his messianic promises and in his determination to save. It could be divided into four parts. You can see it in your outline. Uh, first, in verses 46 through 48, Mary praises God for what he has done for her. He has shown, above all, that he is her Savior. We spoke about that uh, last time. Her spirit has rejoiced, she says, in God my Savior. And the evidence is to be found in her statement in verse 48. He has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. Uh, this is that self-conscious humility without which no person can serve God in truth. It's the first mark of blessedness, the attitude of heart and mind that opens one to God's grace in our lives. It is the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Mary had no illusions of grandeur, uh, no sneaking pretense of superiority in, uh, to other women on account of what God had done in her life. She knew, as we acknowledged in our last lesson, that by the world standards, she was a nobody. She really was. She was a nobody. And whatever blessedness was now hers came only by the free grace of God. And perhaps the truth of Psalm 34, 18 had been germinating in her mind. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And as such, Mary stood for all the seemingly forsaken of Israel, suffering in silence while they awaited their deliverer. But now, because of the marvelous way in which the Lord will honor her, all generations will recognize it and call her blessed. Therefore, not only will her soul magnify the Lord, but her spirit will rejoice in him both soul and spirit, with her whole being, in other words, she will devote herself to glorifying him and enjoying him. And so she describes her intent, uh, her plan, uh, out of gratitude to God, to commit herself to him and, and return praise to him. That's the theme that we've been hearing from Dan so often 
uh, from the pulpit uh, recently, that the life that is pleasing to God is one that is lived in response of, of, of thankfulness to God for what he has done for us. And I would ask uh, each of us to consider, I kind of open with this, are we rejoicing in God our Savior and what he has done for us, our very presence here today, the health to get out of our beds this morning and wash up and come here, what a blessing. Well, next, Mary praises God for his excellencies. She transitions in verse 49, giving a more general account of the reasons future generations will count her blessed. The mighty one has done great things for me, she states. This is Psalm 71, 19. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? But it is more than what he has done. This is a trap we all tend to fall into with God. What have you done with me uh, lately, but here Mary reflects on who he is and, and what he is like. And so see here, he's, he's mighty, he's holy, he is merciful. So first then, God is omnipotent. Uh, the two women, think about it, the two women standing there were living testimonies to the omnipotence of God, both had experienced conceptions that were undeniably miraculous. In verse 35, the, the angel had explained it. Mary had asked, you remember this, Mary had asked, how could it be that a virgin could conceive and bear a son? And Gabriel attributed it simply to the power of God. He said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Almost in the same uh, breath, he explains to Mary how God's might had worked something similar in Elizabeth, impossibly ca causing her, who, has, who was barren, to conceive in her old age. But he explained, nothing will be impossible with God. Perhaps later, uh, Mary had time to contemplate, and the prophet Isaiah predicted in Isaiah 9, verse 6, that a child would be born, a son would be given, and his name would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. And now Mary sings it out. The Mighty One has done great things for me. And he is holy. Holy is his name. Uh, certainly the thought that God was holy was fresh on this young girl's mind. Remember, the angel had pointed it out to her, again, in verse 35. The power of God that had caused her to conceive had logically resulted in this holy thing, her holy child within her, who would be called the very Son of God. Now, when we think of holiness, we, we rightly think of, of moral purity, more, it has moral overtones, but the biblical concept of holiness, I'm sure many of you can recall, uh, points to God's holy otherness, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy otherness. Uh, his complete separation, uh, how he is set apart from all sinful creation and therefore exalted above all. Uh, the moral consequence is a derivative of that kind of holiness. So if you follow Mary's thinking, she must have been thinking of that exalted state of her Lord who was therefore able to accomplish these great things. He is holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, and who also consequently is able to fulfill the promises he has made to the generations of his people who look to him for mercy, for the faithfulness of his covenant made centuries before. God's mercy, his loving kindness, his chesed, his, his covenant loyalty. And Mary was now at peace of the fulfillment of the promises of God from ages 
past. And so we come to verses 51 through 53 and Mary's praise for how God lifts up the downtrodden while putting the proud and arrogant in their place. God delights in reversing the perception of persons. The Bible's filled with examples of that. There's a question of interpretation in these verses, verses 51 through 53. The verbs are, are in the aorist or the past tense, and so may only point to what God has already done in the past. But in the Semitic way of think, thinking and speaking, the tense allows for other understandings than that. It's possible for one, she was thinking of how God habitually Acts, they call that the iterative sense of that verb. He habitually scatters those who are proud in their thoughts. He habitually brings down rulers from their thrones. Doesn't that give you great hope and encouragement? And it's possible that that was what Mary was intending. However, there's yet another way of interpreting this, the language allowed for what is known as a prophetic perfect. It signifies that is what is expressed as a past event is actually something that is going to occur in the future. And it is so certain that it can and perhaps even must be spoken of as having already Occurred, and the best example of that probably, or the most one you're most familiar with, is is used by uh, Paul in that magnificent uh, Romans 8:28 that God causes all things to work together for good for those that love Him, and then He buttresses that argument with this string of logic. Uh, who, those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become a uh, conformed to the image of his son, those whom he predestined, he also called, those whom he called, he also justified, those whom he justified, he also glorified. Well, Paul knew that our glorification was yet in the future, and yet he phrased it as something that was already accomplished in the past in order to communicate as clearly as he could that our glorification with God and before God is so certain that we can speak of it as having already occurred. And so what Mary, here's the application to our passage, what Mary probably was intending was that just as God in the past had scattered the proud, like Pharaoh, for example, and brought down rulers from their thrones like Nebuchadnezzar. She knew all about these people. She knew all about Pharaoh. She knew all about Nebuchadnezzar. So would the son she was bearing perform mighty deeds. He would send away the rich empty-handed, which sadly is what happened with the rich young ruler. He would exalt those who, who were humble you know, too many examples to, to number, but we think of the blind man of, of John chapter 9 and uh, the widow of Nain and the poor beggar Lazarus who received his reward with Abraham while the rich man who had habitually lived in, in splendor uh, was enduring the torments of hell. Mary had come to understand it's helpful for us to understand, too, that scores are not all settled in, in the here and now. God loves to engineer sovereign and righteous reversals of fortune for his own glory. And there could be no ex greater example uh, than the fortune of the one who even then Mary bore in her womb who would be despised and forsaken of men, but whom God would highly exalt and set him upon his throne and every knee would bow before him. Well, finally, in the 54th and 55th verses, Mary portrays God's greatness at his, as it is seen in fulfillment of his covenant 
with Israel. The, the history of Israel was one of God's constant and faithful shepherding of the nation, always in the face of their unfaithfulness. His promise, though, was good. Uh, Mary understood it to be now ultimately fulfilled in the work he was performing through her. What an amazing thought as she concludes her song. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months. So she was six months pregnant when Mary arrived. She left three months later and Luke doesn't even tell her if she hung around for the birth of John the Baptist. We simply don't know, but surely their time together uh, was filled with worship, filled with increasing wonder about God, what God had been doing, had done in them and was continuing to do in them. Well, how are we to think of Mary? Uh, we will always, I think, or must consider her against the backdrop of the Roman Catholic uh, veneration of Mary. But since we're bound by the word of God and not by tradition, not by ecclesiastical edict, we may consider her as she appears to us in the scriptures. That, that is, she is to be admired, even emulated, but never worshiped. However, in Mary, we find our voice. The Lord has had the greatest regard for us. He has extended his favor to us. God's miracle in Mary is our miracle. The miracle of new birth and union with the son that she bore we are the humble and the hungry. He has lifted up. He has lifted us up with him and blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places with him whom Mary bore. And we give all praise to him just as Mary did. Uh, Mary instructs us. Father, thank you for this picture of a humble servant who understands that the blessings that you poured upon her were solely due to your grace and the favor that you extended to her. We thank you that there was a woman that you chose and you uh, made her to be the mother of your son, that when you broke into history in that marvelous way to send a savior into our world who eventually died for our sins and formed a church that would be his testimony through the ages and of which we are a part, that you chose this woman, this simple woman, uh, who was humble and yet righteous, and all generations uh, consider her blessed. Thank you for the son that she bore, uh, most of all. Uh, we give you thanks for him and pray, Lord, that you would increase our faithfulness to him, our love for him, our obedience. In Jesus' name, amen.